So our next speaker is going to be Ed Spencer on the Juniper Ridge Landfill. And probably many of you don't even know what it is, but it's a, it's a dump in, in Old West Old Town that brings in construction and demolition debris. And they were just granted an expansion permit. Um, and so we'll be having more out-of-state construction demolition debris coming into the state. So a round of applause for Ed Spencer. Well, hello. I'm, I'm uh, very pleased and honored to be standing here today with this Alliance for the Common Good. Uh, thanks to Jim and Lou and everybody else who's had a hand in organizing this and getting people here. And uh, I, th I, I think we should all look to uh, people like Steve Coughlin as our, you know, leaders of the future and the present. And uh, he's, he's been a great guy to get to know. And, uh, and I know there's, there's all kinds of people in Maine that feel the same way. Um, this Juniper Ridge landfill began as an attempt to keep a paper mill in Old Town, okay? The uh, paper mill had its own landfill. They said, they had said 10 years before in the early 90s that if we have to, if we can't have our own landfill, we're going to have to move out of Old Town. Then in 2003, the, you know, the owners had changed and they said, if we have to keep this landfill, we're going to move out of Old Town. So the state came in, made a deal, uh, paid off Georgia Pacific, you know, who had just been bought by those cuddly Koch brothers we all know and fear. Um, so anyways, uh, the, the deal was done and the state became the owner, which is a good idea. I, I agree with uh, state ownership of, of waste facilities. Unfortunately, the process has been one that grants untold power to the garbage company, Casella, and gives very little power to the actual people of Maine to control it. And they, they are so well entrenched with their lobbyists, their money, that uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to oppose them. And they've more or less uh, captured the regulator uh, which is the DEP and the state as owner. Um, so we're talking mostly about water here today. And this landfill, it's a highly engineered structure, actually. And the idea is to put the waste, pile the waste in such a way that the waste materials are separated from the surrounding lands, right, and waters. They have this liner system, and what they do is they collect the leachate. Think of leachate as dump juice. So it rains on un uncovered portions of the landfill, it comes down, plus the waste is decaying, so there's all this liquid that comes down. Well, they collect it. Good. But what do they do with it? They truck it from West Old Town down to the former Old Town Mill, uh, and where it goes into the mill's wastewater treatment system, and where it is uh, aerated, uh, they check for pH, and they remove some uh, BODs, and uh, then they basically release it into the river. So it's kind of ironic that we're spending millions and millions of dollars to keep this material from getting into the, the uh, groundwater surrounding the landfill, but then we give it a ride down to the river and put it right in there. And the, uh, I actually met with uh, Dan Cousineers of the Penobscot Nation. He's their surface water guy. Had a great meeting with him yesterday afternoon. We went over some of these uh, tests they've done on the, the outfall, you know, where this material goes into the river. Well, there's some problems with that because they only, the leachate itself they test four times a year. The outfall is once a year. Now, the leachate, they test it for like 100 chemical compounds. The outfall, it's less than 10. So that doesn't seem right. Um, and, and we need to, to you know, bring them more together in, in that way. Um, so that, that's something to, to work towards. And a better solution, a better place for the leachate to go, it would be to uh, their backup plan, which is take it to the brewer uh, 
wastewater treatment system, which is a combined municipal and is very large because they used to put their, uh, their brewer uh, paper mill waste in there too. And at least there, there's more tertiary or secondary treatments. Uh, they pull sludge out of it. So all these uh, suspended solids that would tend to go in the solution into the river in Old Town would be contained in sludge, pulled out and put back into the landfill. And as Steve says, you know, this is not sustainable uh, over the, the long, long term at all. Now, so, so that's something we can work on. And, and it, cost, it cost them a quarter million dollars per year, plus the trucking, to dispose of this at the Old Town Mill site. Um, maybe Brewer would be twice that amount of money, you know, and, and twice the trucking also. So there's a solution. Casella's always saying, oh, we recycle, we're green, we're wonderful. Put your damn money where your mouth is, Casella, you know? So the other way it threatens our groundwater is, is, is from the, uh, the threats caused by climate change, right? We know, I've seen firsthand uh, the effects of a 20 inches of rain event in a 24 hour period just devastated the town my son and his family live in, in, in Lyons, Colorado. And that's coming. We don't know when, but it's coming. We're gonna have increasingly larger, more intense storms, and it's just a, a fact. Well, one of the problems with when they plan to build this landfill, the DEP standard is that they need to build for a 25-year flood. Well, I say, wait a minute, you're going to have, in that 25-year period, you're very likely to have a 100-year flood. Well, the standards are the standards, so this is what we do. Now, the company, They'll say, oh, our structures, our stormwater detention structures, can handle a 100-year flood. But when I press them on that, we find out the way they do it is they have a, an overflow spillway. So if they get that precipitation, that huge event, it's going to overflow their structures and go into the surrounding wetlands, which happen to be critical habitat for uh, endangered uh, Atlantic salmon. So, so that's a big problem, and it's, it's going to happen. Uh, probably the third way, this is the threat to the water system. And, and here, these, these under these groundwater systems, everything's interconnected. The same way the surface waters are all interconnected from tiny rivulets to, to giant rivers like the Penobscot, this, something similar is going on underneath the ground was just not as clear to us. So these liner systems, as well-engineered and robust as they are, they're not permanent. And Casella's experts have even testified under oath that all liners leak eventually. So what we're doing is we're piling this big bunch of poison on top of this liner system that we know is going to fail. But it's not, we can't really tell if it's failing yet, if it's starting to leak now, but it's for our grandchildren, you know, our great-grandchildren. And that's obviously not right. Um, so so that's, that's kind of a fact of life, um, that they are going to leak now. The, the existing landfill uh, has a single membrane, you know, a single liner, they call it. Well, now, when they're selling the expansion, they said, oh, this is going to have a double liner. Like, wait a minute. How come we weren't good enough for a double liner in the first place, you know? But now we're going to have a double liner. So. What are we looking at for solutions? Um, I picture waste companies like Casella as a monster, okay? And they, uh, they work to uh, pile up money to pursue their, their profits, and the way to stop them is to starve them. The good news is waste volumes 
are trending downward everywhere. Okay? We thought, they thought that, you know, the, the Great Recession, 2008, 2009, that's why the waste volumes were down, but they're continuing to come down. That's good. That's good news. Keep them coming down. There's all these uh, zero waste initiatives being practiced everywhere. I got to mention, there's a group I, I got to know during this process called PLAN, P-L-A-N, and that's, called, that's for the Post Landfill Action Network. And what they do, they're based at the uh, University of New Hampshire, and they bring students from schools all across the country to these events, these symposiums, and they get together and they talk about zero waste initiatives, indoctrinate these people, and then send them back out into their schools and their communities. And it's, it's, it's a great idea. It's having effects. You know, my little uh, uh, second grader granddaughter out in Colorado, they have a zero waste week where they all practice doing this. You know, so these things, it's coming. But it's, can it come fast enough? And the, one, there's a couple of simple solutions but very difficult to enact that could happen right here. And that is, let's have a common sense definition of what out-of-state waste is. You know, when, when this happened, there was two promises. There will be no out-of-state waste, there will be no municipal solid waste, which is like curbside trash. Both things are happening right now. And the out-of-state, they changed the definition. I'm not even going to repeat it because it's a bastardization of the English language. But it's basically whatever you want to bring in, if it's for stabilizing the landfill, or if it is brought to Maine and processed. Uh, and the other thing that needs definition is recycled material. Okay? Now you think of recycled material, what are we doing it? We're pulling it out of the waste stream, we're recycling it, we're turning it into something else, right? But at our state owned Juniper Ridge landfill, every year, over 100,000 tons of materials, they describe it as fines for daily cover, right? This is classified as a recycled material. 100,000 tons. I mean, it's, it's unreal, but it's, sadly, it is, it is the reality. So you would think our legislators could, could uh, do something this simple, but I'm, I don't know, I'm a very optimistic person, but I'm not sure this can be accomplished uh, as with the current uh, uh, power structure in place here, um, but we're, we're going to try anyhow. Um, the other thing is the, that the, the DEP, I mean, they've got some great employees. They really try hard, I think, but I think basically these major permits are granted for political purposes. And the DEP rules are kind of squishy enough, vague enough, a lot of them, so that they can argue either side of, to get their, their result. So I don't have, I'm all for, I mean, in fact, my feeling is, uh, you know, if, uh, my feeling is the Commissioner of Department of Environmental Protection should be an elected, not an appointed office. Um, and the other, so DEP needs some pressure. The other thing that needs pressure is the state as owner. They're buried in the Bureau of uh, General Services, BGS. They don't do a damn thing to influence, try to influence Casella. It's like Casella has become the de facto main waste agency, which hasn't existed in the state for about a quarter century. And so they just don't do anything. Casella has this idea, oh, we're going to bring more curbside garbage from southern Maine, which violates our state waste hierarchy. And uh, the uh, BGS, the state as owner, just uh, holds our hand and says, here, use our letterhead, make it look official. Sure, we'll blow the hell out of the, uh, the statutes of the state of Maine. We don't care. You know, well, that's wrong, and they need, they need to get reminded of that. Yeah. Um, so, I guess kind of in closing, uh, 
once again, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. I do look to the Penobscot Nation as, as leaders in this. What's good for them is good for the state as a whole. I mean, I'm not going to agree with, you know, 90% of the time, and, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm right with them shoulder to shoulder. Um, but I'd like to, to close with a, a quote from a, a great author, Dr. Seuss. And uh, who said at one point, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing gets better. Never. It's not. So thanks again for inviting me.